Hi, this is Kira Buckland, voice actress for some of your favorite anime and video games. Please enjoy this episode of the Anna Monday podcast, a randomized anime experience. Hello, and welcome to the Andy Monday Podcast. My name is Colin Hemphill. And I'm Kayla Hemphill. On our show, we roll the virtual dice and must watch a randomly selected anime title. Thanks for joining us. We are officially back. The year is 2482. What is happening? We have exited cryosleep and are here to record another audio log. Oh my, I just can't. I can't. (laughs) Uh, it has been a little bit, but hopefully you were able to join us for the Annie Monday Returns episode last Ooh. time. But you are here now listening to the 50th episode proper of the Annie Monday podcast. I can't believe we stopped right before 50. Yeah, we stopped right at 49 and planned to hit 50. Yeah. And then here we are a year and a half later. <laughs> what a way to come back. Well, about a year and a half ago, we hit the random button on Crunchyroll. Back when that was a thing still. (laughs) Yes. And for the student council president to sign off on our podcast, we had to watch four episodes of Love Live Sunshine. (laughs) That might be your best one yet. (laughs) Thank you. So Love Live Sunshine is a spinoff sequel of the original Love Live School Idol Project series. Um But this one doesn't really require any previous knowledge of that particular series. They reference the group from that series a few times, but they kind of explain what it was about and really isn't a whole lot of knowledge transfer needed there. Uh, This one started in 2015 with the release of some music CDs accompanied by anime music videos. And there was a manga released in 2016. And the 26-episode anime series premiered shortly thereafter, with the second season premiering the following year. And then there was a follow-up film titled Love Live Sunshine, the school idol movie, colon, Over the Rainbow. Oh, jeez. And that premiered in 2019. Uh, And they've also introduced all of the new characters from this series into uh, an ongoing video game from the original Love Live franchise. Uh, And I guess the only other thing to note here is that when we rolled this on the previous episode, I think we had rolled basically the original Love Live. Or no, we we did roll Sunshine and we were like, well, this is a sequel series. Should we go back to the original? And we tried to do that, but there was a whole lot of licensing mess that was happening right at the time we rolled the series. Yep. And so both Crunchyroll and Funimation did not have access to the original series. Mm -hmm. In the year and a half since, that has been (laughs) remedied. Yes. You can now watch both, dubbed or subbed. I I think they're on Funimation exclusively. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we looked into it and we saw, well, you don't really need the knowledge of the first series. It's kind of independent. And so uh, let's just watch Sunshine and see how that goes. Uh, So, Kayla, do you want to give us a synopsis? Chika Takami dreams of becoming a school idol to bring some excitement to her boring life. In her sleepy seaside hometown, this might prove to be more difficult than she anticipated. But with her friends by her side, Chika knows she will always be able to find fun and adventure. Yeah, and it really is as simple as that, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I guess we can talk about the characters. I think on an idol show like this where you have a huge cast and they all end up in this group together. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the last idol show that we watched. Um, It really just kind of comes down to the characters. And then a lot of the plot is just revolving around like the next gig, the next Mm -hmm. competition, Mm -hmm. whatever it happens to be. Right. TV appearance or whatever. Yeah. And we really didn't get into any of that. No, they're still in the forming the group aspect of making us an idol group yeah in contrast to idol master where it was the one guy found the main character and she brought like two of her friends along or something and then they just like 
toss them into an existing group already. Yeah. And so you were first couple episodes introduced to like 20 characters. Yeah, and that one, the group hadn't been completed yet, but was mostly done. And this is the opposite. The group is just being formulated. And so you're seeing them bring on each girl one, usually one by one, but sometimes in pairs. Yeah. And also in contrast, this one is very much high school focused. Yes. Um, So it kind of takes in that anime kind of trope as well. Yeah, this is happening during school time. This isn't necessarily their after school gig or whatever. This is this is during club time. So Yeah, and really these first four episodes are kind of revolving around Chica who has an interest in idol groups and specifically the idol group from the original series whose name is Muse. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's spelled like Mew the character <laughs> apostrophe s. Yes. Um which is garbage. <laughs> Tom gets very upset about it. But anyway, what I don't I don't know. What do you want to say about Chica? I think Chica is a pretty stereotypical idol character. She's the one that is trying to hype you into being interested in idol. So she is over the top with her enthusiasm. She's the go-getter. She's the I'm going to make this happen no matter what. You can't get me down sort of person. And I think the thing that kind of sucks about this character is that she frequently gets rewarded for being pushy. She's still friendly about her pushiness. Like, she isn't a get out of my way, like get on board or get out of my way kind of person. But she's still pushy. (laughs) And And she still wins people over, not because she's like, oh, man, I really see you for who you are. At least she's that way with one person. But most of them, she's just like, I'm going to keep bothering you until you join my group. And they do. In a very self-serving kind of way. Like, this is her dream, and she wants other people in on her dream because you can't be a solo idol group. And she has very little regard for what people are telling her. Like... There's another character, we'll talk about her in a second, whose dream it is to be a pianist. And she's like, hey, I really want to focus on that. So I don't want to join your idol group. And Chica just keeps being like, yeah, but you should join our group. But like, don't you want to? Like over and over. And so it's sort of like, okay, like, I see you trying to engage with this girl, but you're still pushing the thing, even though they've told you no more than once. Yeah, and literally the character motivation behind Chica is that she verbally says the point of her being like the generic, boring protagonist. And because she verbally says that that is who she embodies like she is just boring and normal and that's that's who she is um the only thing that can make her shine is what she keeps saying Mm -hmm. is to be a school idol and so i think starting to talk about some of the kind of supporting characters uh rico is the one you mentioned who Mm -hmm. is the piano player Mm -hmm. and she transfers in from tokyo where um she kind of takes on immediately this artist must suffer for their art kind mm. of role, mm-hmm. which sucks because yeah. it's not true. Right. Artists shouldn't do that. No, please don't. Um, and everyone kind of encourages that to a certain degree. Yeah, nobody seems to be giving her the space to not pursue her music. Everybody's just sort of like, well, hopefully you'll figure it out. Let's try and find new ways for you to figure it out instead of resting. Yeah, and she says something like, she's trying to hear the sound of the sea or (laughs) the music that the sea makes or something. And that's why she's come to this like sleepy little seaside town. And so you meet her with her like jumping into the sea in the middle of winter. 
And um, that's pretty much what we know about this character so far, uh, except that ultimately she becomes the one that the entire group relies on. Yep. Because she's the only actual musician. Yeah. She's the only one with talent. And so she's the only reasonable reason that these girls are going to do well at all. And so I think the thing to note about maybe all idol shows, but especially in this one, the ability to sing is completely assumed in that Chica doesn't going go around asking people like, Hey, are you an okay singer? Do you, you know, do you like to sing? Do you, are you good at this? Are you tone deaf? <laughs> it's just assumed that everyone in this show can sing. Everyone in this universe. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Because she asks everybody, every single person she meets. Yeah. Um, and so when Rico comes in and like, oh, you play the piano, that must mean like you can write all of our songs for us and we just need to get you over this writer's block kind of thing <laughs> because that's really like impeding my dream because we can't write music. It's also interesting that we're talking about Rico's writer's block. Because part of the way she's solving it is kind of what you're saying about, like, she has to suffer for her art. Chica tries to stop her from jumping in the water because she thinks she's going to hurt herself, like, going in, like, ice water. Right. And then an episode later, she is the three of them, actually. So it's Chica, Rico, and, and the third girl we'll talk about in a second. And they all dive into the ocean. Uh-huh. And it's totally fine. And this is like maybe a week or two later. Yeah, but Kayla, this time they put on wetsuits and snorkeling gear. Oh, uh, fair. I didn't remember the wetsuit part. But yeah, it still seems not, not great. Mm -hmm. But I guess that does... I don't know. It's hard to segue to Yo Watanabe because... She doesn't do anything in this show. She dances. She's the choreographer. I noticed okay. that on the second watch. There you go. We had to watch this twice because we watched it a year ago. <laughs> we had to watch it now. She's the one that comes up with the choreography. So Chica really doesn't do anything. No, of course not. She, I think Chica writes some lyrics. Okay. So sure. maybe she might also write some lyrics. Um, yeah, if there's anything I know about non-songwriters writing lyrics, it's that... <laughs> They'll give you stuff that cannot be written into a song. Which is weird because you don't really hear Rico's song before we see the lyrics. But mm -hmm. let's, let's, I guess, suspend some logistics there. Yeah. So Yo is Chica's childhood friend. And uh, she mostly seems to exist in the show as an enabler for Chica. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's just typing her up or letting her vent about something or whatever it is, like she doesn't contribute a whole lot, except like you said, she, I guess, choreographies, does the choreography for their dance numbers. She's also more successful at recruiting people than Chica, mm -hmm. not specifically to the group, but when they have to go around town to bring people to their show, it's. It's Yo that is able to get people interested in coming. Yeah. She seems like the chill version of Chica. Right. And probably the actual person who should be the leader of this group, but seems an awful lot like Chica's kind of gunning for that role. Yeah. She did make an offhanded comment when she was talking with her mom or her sister one time that was saying like, this is the first time I've seen Chica really care about anything. Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe she's taking a back seat to be like, wow, Chica actually cares about something. True. So I'm going to let her and support her in the one thing she actually cares about. All right. You want to uh, lightning round some of the other characters, I guess? Well, we can try. Okay. I'll start with Kanan uh, or Kanan. I don't remember exactly. Um, she works at a dive shop in this town. Uh, like scuba diving. Yeah, that um, is operated by her family. And she is supposedly taking leave from school at this time. 
to kind of run the shop while her dad is recovering from an injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, like when they go snorkeling to hear the sound of the ocean or whatever, convenient that they have a, uh, you know, friend in a dive shop to just hand them some gear. Yep. Magical gear, uh, <laughs> like snorkels that work underwater. <laughs> Which we determined for several minutes. Okay, let's say we did determine that there are snorkels that do this. However, yes, that you can go underwater with for brief amount. You of cannot time. breathe. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and it's alluded that this character was involved in some previous idol group at some other point. Kind of like uh, another character, Dia, who is the student council president. Mm-hmm. And hates idols. Hates them. <laughs> she thinks they're ridiculous. Ridiculous. And uh, is very aggressive about that. Just outrageously aggressive. Anytime. Like, idols! Idols! <laughs> <laughs> but also is a huge gatekeeper when it comes to idol worship. Right. Yeah, it's kind of revealed in the first few episodes that she has some sort of history with idols. Um I think she had, like, previously started an idol group at school, and she's a huge, huge muse nut and knows everything about them, Mm -hmm. and then uh, suddenly became anti-idol, including, like, berating her sister for still liking idols Mm -hmm. and things like that. Another girl that ends up joining the group by the end of the fourth episode is the sister... Of Dia, who is Ruby. Right, who's kind of the um, characteristic, shy, doesn't really want to be in the spotlight kind of person. uh, Kind of hides behind her friend, Hanamaru. uh, And she doesn't turn out to be super important at all. Uh, She likes to read and be alone. Uh, But Ruby just kind of hangs out with her. And uh, desperately, desperately wants to be an idol. Still loves idols, despite how her sister has kind of turned anti-idol. And um, is mostly worried throughout the show about her sister disapproving Mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think the last character for us to focus on is Mari, who's really a one big plot device. Because everything she does... Sets the rest of the show in motion. She literally flies in on a helicopter to (laughs) insert plot into the show and then leaves. She vaguely comes back when the plot finds it necessary. Uh, The the only things we really know about Mari, she seems to be Italian-American. And she comes from a very wealthy family uh, who sponsors the school that they all attend And that gives her unlimited plot power. (laughs) Can basically just do whatever she wants, including overruling whatever Dia thinks is appropriate as the student council president by throwing her authority around. Mari seems to be an older, more conniving version of Chica. Yeah, I can see that. She very much pushes what she wants. She's personable enough that people don't dislike her like she's not rude like the student council president but she's gonna get her way yeah and so the primary plot device that she throws into the show is that hey i will approve your idol group if you can do this one thing which is you have to fill the entire school auditorium uh full of people at your concert, and then you're approved, regardless of what student council president says. So something that I haven't quite mentioned yet is that I took the liberty to play the mobile game. Yes. (laughs) And so I, surprisingly, the mobile game is really close to the anime. Mechanically, we're talking... Typical gotcha kind of thing, right? Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. With rhythm elements, if I remember. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it had a little bit of a 
Well, the only reference I have is DDR, but any sort of like you tap the thing at the right time in the song and you get maybe, points. Maybe like the, um, I don't know, the Hatsune Miku, Miku games or, or something like that. Probably a close analog. Probably. However, in the mobile game, the plot goes a little bit faster than the anime, which yeah. is weird. But also that it's broken up with dance sequences. And this story really drags like in the show it takes us four episodes to get one dance right which is what the show whole show is about unless you count the uh opening animation there's one there that is true that is true but from what i can tell from both the anime and the game is that this story is really about two different groups coming together There's the Chica group that we're seeing being assembled. And by the fourth episode, from what we can tell, the Chica group has assembled. Yeah. So there's five girls in the Chica group. And then there's the Dia group, which is the three girls who were in the previous idol group. And you can tell there's like weird tension with all of them anytime that Mari interacts with either the dive shop girl or the student council president. They bristle around her. They have real issues with the way that she left. Whatever that means. And we know from the anime, from the opening animation, the closing animation, that they're in this group. Yeah, there's no surprise to any of this. So somehow we're going to get this contrast of the old group that fell apart and struggled because they didn't have the glue person. And Chica is going to be the glue person. Right. And that's why this group is going to be successful is because they have Chica to hold the group together. Yeah. And that's the the show. The generic filler character who anybody can relate to. Yep. Yeah. And that's, from what I can tell, going to be this show. And that's why Chica is up front and center is because she's going to be the reason why this group can stick together, why they won't go off and pursue their own idol interest or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the only other things that happen plot-wise in the four episodes, like we talked about, Chica harasses and guilts people into joining the group with her for the whole four episodes. And... They do some training and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. climbing a bunch of stairs. Yes. Uh, To build endurance so they can sing longer and dance at the same time. Yes. Which, actually, I'm probably... Sure. Yeah, it seems... Uh, Except they only ever sing one song. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then, uh, you know, there's a little bit of preparation for this concert that they're going to put on in the fourth episode including writing the music and learning a dance sequence and stuff like that. Also coming up with their band name. Yes. (laughs) So the band name, (laughs) I'm going to say, is Aqua. Yeah. The English word Aqua. It seemed like that's what they were saying in the English. Yes. I mean, I guess not English word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It is spelled... A Q U O R S. Yep. Aquars. So I don't know. Some translation thing, something happened there mm-hmm. that doesn't really make any sense. It's like Muse, and the way that they spell it is dumb, but <laughs> at so least bad. it's clever. Sure. And it it works. Like Muse being a kind of musical word, and then they figured out a weird way to write it. But Colin, somebody wrote this word on the beach for them to find. Yes. And we'll talk about this later, but <laughs> every problem in this show is solved for them by doing nothing, mm-hmm. including the day that they go out to the beach and are desperately throwing around ideas for their band name. And then suddenly it just appears on the beach. Aquars. And they're like, oh, yeah, that says aqua, right? That's like water stuff. That's our <laughs> band name now. Okay. So salty. 
It's very difficult to name bands. Fair. And sometimes it just appears on an Oblivion loading screen. Oh my goodness, I can't. And sometimes it just washes up on the beach. Yeah, I guess so. All right, so um, on that note, I guess uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to talk about the production. We're in the home stretch now. Settle in for a short break, and we'll be right back with more anime. Okay, we are back. So, Colin, what did you think about the production elements of the show? So I think uh, the first thing to note is that uh, we did watch this twice, obviously, very mm-hmm. far apart. Yes. And uh, the first time, uh, the only version that we had access to was the subbed version on Crunchyroll. Mm-hmm. Because of all the licensing stuff that was shifting at the time, when we came back to it, we did have access to the dub. And so we also tried that the second time just to see how they compared. Yep. Uh, And because we generally like dubs. Yeah. Uh, And so we did listen to both. And obviously, they're both good. Um, I appreciated that in the English dub version, they don't try to mess with the songs. Yes, I don't know if this is something that people have finally learned this lesson to not try to translate Japanese songs into English because it definitely doesn't work. It's a yeah, it's a very very challenging art form and it it kind of fundamentally breaks the thing that people, you know, appreciate about dubs, which is that they localize, they don't just translate. Mhm. Uh, which is to say, like, a th- cultural thing that wouldn't make sense to an American audience. Sometimes they kind of try to translate in that in a way that makes sense um, so that you're still catching the same meaning, not just the words. Um, and it's really, really difficult to do that with music because if you translate directly, does not work musically at all. And then you're basically going off of like trying to capture the emotional intent of a song, which kind of fundamentally changes the song. It's not really even like a cover or a dub or anything at that point. The only place that I've ever seen it be done successfully was in a very specific instance, which was when Rad Wimps did the music for Your Name. And the reason why that worked was because the singer and, in this case, I assume, songwriter, yeah. he speaks both Japanese and English. And so he was able to write songs knowing that he would translate them from Japanese into English. Yeah. So he wrote the songs in a way that it could be translated and still fit in the song. And also he sang both versions. Right. Yeah. Like having the same person even singing the English versus the original Japanese um, is even a big difference. And so while the dubbed songs in your name aren't perfect, um, it's definitely like the closest we've gotten to kind of feeling like it was meant to be that way. So that being the rare exception to the general rule that, by and large, I would say that a show benefits from keeping the Japanese version of a song, even if there is really good English dubs for the rest of the show. Yeah, especially in a thing that is fundamentally dependent on its music. So, like, K-On! does this, too. They Mm -hmm. keep the Japanese lyrics in the show. And I think this is even more important in a show that also includes choreography, because if you were to change, you know, the certain hits of certain words, it would be really disruptive to see a a dance not match, because a lot of choreography 
can have elements of being about the rhythm in a song, but it can also be about hitting at the right spot lyrically. And so it it would be incredibly difficult, I would think, to translate something when so much is being geared towards a particular version of a song. Right. Yeah, so um, I think that is kind of a good decision they made for this one. Um, Now, you had mentioned disruptive (laughs) uh, choreography and dance numbers. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Because this show has some. We have some different opinions about this for different reasons. We we may they may not be that different. Uh, okay, so this show when it switches into idol mode, when it is one hundred percent, they're on stage, costumed, dancing. Yep. There is an obvious shift in the animation into a CG kind of three D rendered variant. Correct. And generally, this one is pretty watchable. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had some examples of like whatever that dance show was. Oh man, um, it was the kids. Yeah, it, was it was the, the break kids. dancing one. Whatever, uh, it'll come to me later. <laughs> but like that one had a distinct, even like the set pieces changed in the show when they went to a dance number, and that's because it was fully mo capped by professional dancers, and so the dance parts were kind of separate from the show. This show wants to keep them the same, and so they've tried really hard to make the character designs translate well between those two shows, uh, those two sequences. And generally, I think I've done it successfully. Um, The dance sequences don't seem like super unnatural or really off-putting. I have seen cases of like um, Zombieland Saga, Mm -hmm. which had... Uh, really just kind of nice 2D animation for the most part. And then the idle sequences were just not <laughs> not the same level of quality. Right. Um, and so it was, it was really obvious that like maybe that show didn't have quite the budget or uh, the studio didn't have quite as much experience or whatever it was. But in this case, they invested a whole lot into making these sequences feel congruent with the rest of the show and part of that i think was is that it came from the game or they reused it for the game knowing that there was going to be a game i don't know which order that was done in so the sequences that you see are some of the sequences that you would see in the game so it has that style of animation for that so most of the game is you know, set up in a visual novel type style. Everything's kind of flat and uh, characters, you know, swap in and out as they're talking, but they're not really moving a whole lot. It's kind of like one single frame at a time until you get to the rhythm part of the game. And so basically what you're seeing in the show are those rhythm game elements. And so for me, I was like, oh, I know what this is because I've seen this in the game or I've actually played this, this song in the game. Right. And so, to me, it was more of a throwback to that. And so, it it kind of helped me because I, I had something to tie it to, to be like, oh, this is like seeing this in the game. And so, it was kind of exciting for me to see that. But it was also kind of nice to take this flat, you know, visual novel kind of thing and then see them be animated. So, for me, it was like a step above what the game was. Yeah. Even though I, I just had experienced them at the same time. I guess the other thing I would say about the production elements is that I really don't connect with the character design of Love Live, um, especially compared to Idolmaster, which I think were totally Mm -hmm. reasonable character looks. Um, These don't really click with me. I think they're way too (laughs) overexpressive. Yes. And their proportions are bizarre. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably on purpose, and maybe it's so that the transition between, like, the dance sequences and the kind of day-to-day sequences are less, I don't know, maybe there's something about those animation styles that kind of relies on those proportions and features. Mm -hmm. Um, But generally, when I'm just looking at Chica, she repels me. (laughs) 
I think it's the eyes. And yeah. so this is my theory. I think if you really just look at her eyes, they are overly shiny. They have a lot of, I call them shiny marks. I don't know what they might actually be called in anime, like in animation. But she has like the normal iris. She has the normal like pupil and everything. But she has all of these marks that are constantly like glowing at you. And it's it's because she's shining. Yeah. Okay. Well, she sure. has to shine. Okay. But everybody has this. So she does it the most. So I think that's why Chica in particular like gets you. But everybody is kind of overly shiny in their eyes. Their eyes are all very big, very bright in a way that is not. It feels above what a lot of normal anime does. Even at this time that this was drawn, like the portions of their, you know, eyes to head, you know, there's different, we've talked about this before, there are different styles throughout the years that have changed the eye size and Mm -hmm. things like that. This is in line with what we were seeing at that time, but their eye designs are over the top. Yeah. And the rest of them are just kind of plain. So usually in idol shows or any ensemble cast, they try to distinguish how people look through what they're wearing or their hair color or hairstyle. And they're kind of doing it with each other's eyes, which is weird and a little disruptive because they all have fairly normal like hair color that exists without box dye. Yeah. And they're all wearing the same uniform that's only changed based on your school year. So they wear different colors based on what year they're in. And other than that, there's not a whole lot of difference. Yeah. So they have big, bright, shiny, different colored eyes. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I guess aside from like their normal look, they also have their idol look. <laughs> okay. These I kind of like because they very much give me Sailor Sailor Moon yeah. vibes and I'm into it. Yeah. So I know this is a distinct idol style that people are into not my thing it's like the um very elaborate over the top sailor uniform yeah with the tiny little hat off (laughs) to the side um which to be fair they are school idols so this might be a specific sort of vibe for school idols as opposed to a different maybe demographic of idol could be yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about idol culture or anything like that. Sure. The three shows that we've seen have all had sailor outfits as their idols, costumes. Um, okay. So the music. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just no, that's it. <laughs> that's all you have to say on the, on the matter. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's... <laughs> In the game, in in the show, in the show we don't get it as much, but I did play the game. So in the game and in the show, it's pretty standard idol stuff. You know, it's it's your generic pop. It is not like your everybody listens to this pop. Right. It's the pop that you listen to at that right time, at that right age, and then everyone forgot about it as soon as we were out of that. That's what this pop is. Yeah. It's not the stuff that like sticks with us generation to generation. It's just, you know, boring pop, which is fine. Yeah, written by high schoolers too. That's also true. Um, but like not in the like this was part of the plot of K-On was that somehow Mio got stuck with the lyric writing and it turns out she's like the sappiest uh writer in the world. And this is just like just sappy enough to be bad, but like not intolerable enough that you wouldn't put it down on paper and sing it as part of a school idol group. Well, and I think the difference between something like K-On and something like this show is that K-On presents it as here's something endearing. Here's this girl who's, you know, Mia's really nervous. She's very shy. And so she's presenting her heart and her expression in the way that a quiet, shy girl who's inexperienced at writing music does. In something like 
uh, the school idol show, it, it it's supposed to be presented as like, yeah, people are really into this. And and it's not presented as isn't that cute that she's yeah. trying? So so you take it as like people in this universe think that this is good. Right. Whereas in Kaon, people did think it was good, but because they loved her, not necessarily because like everybody in the world would think it was good. Oh yeah. No, in Kaon, they they literally walk up to them afterwards and are like Wow, clapping and applauding. That that was so amazing. Y'all aren't very good, are you? <laughs> yeah. um, and it was like the stage presence and the uh, energy and the... Yeah. And the like, earnestness. That earnestness they... of, of their performance is what drew them, uh, drew people to them. Mm-hmm. In this one, yeah, we're supposed to believe that like an entire auditorium of people shows up for this concert of one song and is like, wow, they're so cool. They're so good. Mm-hmm. This is amazing. And like, I can't buy that. I can't for a second buy that. You've never lived in a super small town, have you? Uh, I, I mean, the original series <laughs> is in Tokyo, though. Yeah, but we didn't listen to that one. Maybe their songs are better. Yeah. I'm saying in a really super small town where everybody knows everyone there is that sort of vibe of like, hey, you're doing something and we love that you're doing something and like we're excited and this is new and like, yay. I would also like to point out like plot point that nobody seems to recognize that another idol group was here like two years ago. No. But that's not either here or there. Yeah. And and I guess to be fair, like we have heard them perform literally one song that they wrote mm-hmm. and then... We've heard the intro song, mm-hmm. which in theory is one of their songs. Sure. Um, and it's fine. Yeah, it's the same. It's fine. <laughs> so I think for me, my biggest takeaway from this show is that it's a pretty generic idol show. I don't think it's going to say anything in particular that. Any other idol show hasn't already said. I don't think the characters are going to, you know, really stick with me in a way that other idol characters haven't. And the only thing I can really think of that I can appreciate from this show is the fact that it gives me better appreciation for what a show like Magical Girl Ori was teasing about. It's like, oh, okay, now I know a little bit more about this genre. Now I understand like more of the jokes and more of what they were kind of poking fun at. Right. Knowing the source material of the satire is makes the satire funnier. And I think because this show is an idol show, but it's very much a slice of life. And so the energy level for the show is very low for something that's supposed to feel very hyped up. And so the plot just kind of drags, the characters kind of drag. And I feel like there should be more energy. You know, even with Cinderella Girls, there was the energy of like, all these girls are different, so they all have a different, like, theme to them, and yeah. they're all getting really excited about the show. And and even if, you know, I wasn't over the top about that show either, there was something that could, like, stick with me. Mm-hmm. Love Life Sunshine de- isn't really going to stick with me. It's just sort of like, okay, you're, like, the second-tier idol group after this other show that maybe I should be watching that group. Yeah, if there's one thing that consistently bothered me about this show, it's that it pulls every single punch and any obstacle that is placed in the show is completely is completely irrelevant to the actual events of the show and is immediately resolved and and overcome by by some ex machina that comes in. And um, I think the the key Example of that is kind of the driving plot point of the first four episodes, which is we got to recruit enough people to be eligible to start a club. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out, well, that doesn't really matter because the 
Council mm-hmm. president's just going to deny you even if you find that many members. And then Mari's going to come in and undo that decision. Yeah. And make you a group even if you don't have that many numbers. Yeah. Um, and so it's just one character provides a solution. One character provides a stumbling block. Another character comes in, provides a solution. And uh, like nobody is actually improving or getting better or working towards being a better idol group or working towards fixing the relationship with the council president to maybe change her mind or whatever it is. Um, It's just something comes in and fixes the problem like a helicopter parrot. (laughs) And uh, this culminates in this concert that they're supposed to have at the school auditorium where the requirement, the arbitrary requirement is that they have to fill this auditorium with people to be approved by the rich girl. And um, so they like pass flyers out around town and they talk to all their friends and everyone at school and they make announcements and and all this stuff. And uh, she also like, Chica talks to her sister who has all these coworkers and was like, please, just anyone, it doesn't matter, bring bring all your coworkers. And they show up at the auditorium dressed up and ready to perform with these three girls. And curtains go up and no one there. There's like five people clapping in the middle of a huge <laughs> auditorium. Yeah. It's like, oh, yes. <laughs> I connect with this show. I hated it up to this point, but now I understand because I've played this room before. Yes. And they try to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very disappointing for them, but they like try to make it through the song anyway. And well, even if this doesn't work out, like we're having fun, we're going to perform for these five people or whatever. And then uh, more roadblocks come in the way of it's the middle of a storm that night and all the power goes out. So their song stops and all the lighting goes down. And then the characters like bust down crying. Like that's it. It's, it's over. Like, you know, our dream is shattered and everything went wrong and we'll never be an idol group. And uh, so they're like, crying and sobbing through trying to sing the song with no backing music and all this and uh then this like friend character goes and gets a generator a single generator Mm -hmm. that will power the entire auditorium yep with lighting and a sound system and everything Mm -hmm. somehow yep and then when the lights come back on there's like Hundreds of people in the room and it's full and they're applauding and clapping because she wrote down the wrong time on the announcement flyer. Mm -hmm. And so her sister who brought in all of her co-workers Mm -hmm. uh, like shows up late. Yep. And like all of those logistics not making any sense aside, why would hundreds of people show up in a thunderstorm to listen to half of one song? And then go home. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of these things coming in to fix it. And so there have been zero obstacles so far. Even their name was just provided for them. Um, and so I think if this continues to where they just keep winning idol competitions and, you know, maybe one day they have their bad night and they, they don't win, <laughs> but they immediately overcome it by... Mm-hmm. Someone doing something for them, Mm -hmm. that's going to be really bothering me. Um, And I think so far has been my biggest uh, complaint about the show. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I need to ask, but Colin, would you watch more of this show? Um, No. (laughs) Uh, I, I know, like, there are a lot of people who like... Love Live, obviously. I think this is the anime car that happens the most often. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like people who have big wraps on their car with anime characters. It's Mm -hmm. full of Love Live people. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's because Muse is great and the original season everyone loves and maybe the 
discussion around sunshine is not so popular. Mm -hmm. um, that could be the case, and maybe the original is kind of more what we would be looking for in an uh, idol show. Maybe just compared to the most recent one we saw, which is uh, a completely different vibe, despite being an idol show, mm -hmm. felt much better to me. And even that, I think I said no one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I don't think this one is for me. Um, and I really wish that there had been an idol show we've seen so far that I was into. I still really liked Magical Girl Horry. <laughs> well, that hardly qualifies, ah, but... We disagree. <laughs> it's a comedy. <laughs> yeah, it works. I'm going to agree. I'm also going to say no, mostly because I'm going to expect more out of idol shows now. Having dipped my toe in this a little bit more, I think you're right. I think you have to do more than the bare minimum. And the show did the bare minimum. And and it did fine. But that's the thing. It was just fine instead of good or instead of great. And I think at this point, especially with how prevalent things like the idol industry is, you have to be more than just okay. And I think that this show really benefits from being so closely tied to the more successful larger part of the franchise. I was also thinking, I think part of the success has to do with how big these games are. Yeah. These, these games are huge in the same way that we talked about the Cinderella, is it Cinderella girls? The same way that we talked about the Cinderella girls last year with their game is these gotcha games are big. They are very prevalent they have huge fan bases, and part of what works is that everybody can find an idol that, like, you know, shares their birthday or shares their interest or they have a similar personality to, and they mm -hmm. latch on to that character. And I think this show is just kind of running after the, the more successful version of it. It's just kind of riding those coattails. Uh, I guess the only other thing I'll mention is I read that the rich girl character, her favorite genre of music is industrial metal. <laughs> and if that is a prevalent plot point to where maybe she starts sliding in some Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> and so the idol group, instead of their pop stuff, is singing... Head like a hole. No. <laughs> uh, I'd watch that. Okay, one. You I would definitely watch that. <laughs> you know that that's not going to happen. But she did disappear, so maybe that's what she went to go do. Yeah. <laughs> but probably not. Well, if you want to learn more about us, visit our old episodes, or, you know, just find out what... Uh, we've been doing for the last year, uh, you can visit our website at anamonday.moe. That's anamonday.moe. You can send us any questions or comments to podcast at anamonday.moe. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our username is anamondaycast. And you can find links for that on our website. Once again, uh, if you listened to last week, I will plug anamonday.moe slash random. Uh, because Crunchyroll has changed their UI to remove the random button and uh, is potentially removing that permanently with their new interface that's rolling out soon, uh, we've kind of developed our own. And so you can go roll your own anime um, and uh, kind of do what we're doing and suffer alongside us. It's good suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, yeah. <laughs> Thanks also to C2A for providing the intro and outro music for our show, which come from the Senpai EPs available on his Bandcamp and other major streaming services. And uh, also, big shout out to uh, his new album, Senpai 3. Which is great. Which is a very, very good album. Uh, and you should go check it out. He keeps getting more and more talented. Mm -hmm. It's unfair. Yeah, he's even got uh, a music video for one of the tracks off that album, which is really so good. good. So good. Um, and there's a whole like light novel that goes alongside the album that yeah. he wrote. Uh, very cool. Too much talent in one person. 
Time to roll. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> Ran the button in three, two, one. Our anime for this episode is Welcome to Demon School, Iruma-kun. And the first episode is called Arumakun from the Demon School. It's basically just a flip of the title, huh? <laughs> yes. Uh, also, I'm pretty sure this is an isekai. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we don't get enough of those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're getting a school show and an isekai. Yeah. Great. That's an interesting combination. Mm-hmm. It's something about demons. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's the isekai part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, I guess that's going to do it for us this week. And uh, thanks for coming back. Yeah, what do we usually do at the end of these shows? Uh, bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>